Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Vanguard. We got another great stream for you guys today. Super, super excited to hang out with everyone and go through some news. We're also going to be welcoming back friend of the show, RJ, aka Comrade Curls on Twitter. So super excited to chat with RJ again today and just go through some news. It's been a total disaster, to be honest, if you guys have been following these reconciliation negotiations, the, the build back better plan. But that being said, Zach and I have been pretty much correctly predicting the way this would unfold from the beginning. So I guess it's a little bit vindicating as well, but still super depressing. So we'll go over all that as well as some pretty juicy Twitter drama that I saw this morning going down between Brianna Joy Gray, someone who is always pissing off the elites and the the libs on Twitter. So, you know, great, great stuff there. Excited to get to that as well. Uh, but yeah, what's up, Zach? How you doing, man? Yeah, you know, it's been one big, long fucking grind with this infrastructure bill. You know, we've talked about it a lot on our show, how Bernie should have just fucking turned up his nose at any kind of negotiation beyond 3.5. He already did his negotiating down there since then. We've seen just the complete whittling away of any kind of sensible legislation. So obviously we'll get deep down into that. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of good stuff to cover. The You know, uh, things aren't going super great, but at least we have each other kind of mentality for the stream today. At least we have a community of people that, you know, want to call spades a spades and, you know, tell people uh, when, you know, dog shit is being served to us so that we can correctly just fucking kick it away we talked about on our last stream what was it two days ago how you know bernie was out doing a panel trying to get people to sweep up the crumbs and it's our job to be like no fuck that and 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 don't ever try and sell that to us again it's your job to to you know say fuck you no i'm not voting but anyway we'll get into all of that as always though we do shout out our patrons at the beginning and end of every live stream so I do want to quickly do that before we forget to yeah, absolutely. Huge, huge, huge shout out to the patron community. Thank you so much to everyone supporting our show on patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. It really does keep us going. It really does make this show possible. And we genuinely, sincerely thank everyone supporting the show financially on Patreon. Again, that link is in the description. If you want to join our patron community, you can hit up that first link in the description. I uh, got some new patrons. Um, thanks so much for joining. Cog, Revolt, Curious Chipmunk, Catherine McNish, Carrie Ross, Grant or James uh, Gant. I uh, really appreciate the new members. Um, thank you so much for the support. Like I said, it really does make the show possible and keep Zach and I you know, coming at you guys at a pretty much almost every other day basis. So yeah, thanks so much uh, to everyone supporting the show. That link is in the description. And obviously, as we always say, if you can't support the show, that's totally fine. But we do just please ask that you hit that uh, like button and that subscribe button that's uh, another amazing way to help out the channel, help us beat the algorithm, which we are perpetually up against. So, yeah, just a, a huge shout out to everyone supporting the show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. If you want to check out all of the benefits we offer, you can hit up that link and find out more. It's the first in the description. But, yeah, uh, got some good stuff to go over today. We are waiting for RJ to show up. I think he might be having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties he said he's trying to fix his laptop issue right now so he'll he'll be joining us shortly uh but no worries we can just plow right in um is there anything in particular you want to start with i want to wait for rj to get to the brianna joy gray stuff because i know he has some thoughts there um but do you maybe want to start with this crystal ball radar to just get people on the same page yeah, I think that this is a great radar. I was super excited to see this position come out from somebody with the, the you know the clout that Crystal has. She reaches so many people, and this is the exact argument that I I, I think people need to hear. You know, it, it really recalls uh, what Kashama Sawant was saying on that Bad Faith podcast that we played not too long ago. Uh, so yeah, let's get into that because I'm sure we'll both have a lot to say. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do just that. Um, this was a pretty good radar from Crystal Ball. And regardless of your opinion of Crystal Ball or breaking points in general, I think she undeniably does a really good job breaking down um, just exactly how fucking castrated this bill has become and what exactly the progressives in Congress should do in response to this latest gutting. It does look like our special guest RJ is here. So before we plow into this, I uh, can welcome him to the stream. How you doing, man? How's it going? Not getting any audio from you, RJ. Are you plugged in? Technical difficulties, man. This is DIY media for you. I hear audio now. 
Can you hear me now? Do I sound like robotic or no? No, you're good. Okay, yeah, you sound perfect. fine, man. Thanks so much for thanks so much for joining us today, RJ. How you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Nice to be with you guys as always. Favorite guys. Love watching your show. Watch your show the most actually the last couple of weeks, so that's always been nice. Hell yeah, man. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. So obviously, there's plenty of shit to sift through, as there always is. Right now, we're about to tackle this uh, crystal ball radar on the infrastructure bill. Uh, basically, you know, calling on people to just abandon ship and not vote for this piece of shit that's uh, basically not worth anybody's time at this point. Completely hollowed out anything that's left as a boon to the corporations and not the people. But that's nothing you don't already know, RJ. But let's get into this clip. Yeah, and real quick, did want to shout out the super chat. Thank you so much, Matt Ocelot God eighty one for the five bucks. Eyes on Adam Jones and the sustainability and self sufficiency compendium. We have to save the world ourselves. The knowledge we need is all around us. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll look into that. I uh, really appreciate the comment, though, Matt Ocelot. Thank you so much for the donation as well. Uh, but yeah, let's let's take a look at this crystal ball radar. I was just saying, RJ, that regardless of what people think about crystal ball or breaking points, I think it's pretty undeniable that she does a fantastic job in this instance breaking down this build back better negotiation, just what a disaster it's become. And like I said, what progressives in Congress should do in response to this absolute gutting of a bill that at one point was seemingly fairly based. Guys, as we discussed, we've now got some real details on exactly what the White House wants in the final reconciliation package. And as I said before, there is just no way around it. This thing is a dog in nearly every way. So let's just go again through some of the details per Jeff Stein. First of all, overall price tag, maximum of $1.9 trillion and more likely in the $1.75 trillion range for those keeping score at home. That is more than $4 trillion less than the $6 trillion progressives ultimately wanted but a mere 0.25 trillion off of what the corporate Democrats demanded. Now look, top line is not everything, of course, but it does give you a pretty decent sense of what direction this package that has been proposed is ultimately tilted in. Critical programs are stripped down entirely or they're radically reduced. The child tax credit would only be extended for a year in the middle of a pandemic when voters routinely say that healthcare is their top priority every healthcare proposal would be significantly scaled back. Now, progressives are holding on to the fact that expansion of Medicare benefits may be kept in, but even on that front, analysts are warning the numbers don't really add up and it might be dramatically underfunded. Biden even collapsed on what he said was one of his own top priorities, that's free community college. He told voters very recently that he was insisting on that provision being in the final package. So much for that. It is gone, replaced pathetically by some scholarships. But wait, there's much more here. Affordable housing money slash elder care money slashed, paid leave slashed, prescription drug reform most likely is gonna be out. Finally, and critically, the climate change provisions have been totally gutted. Manchin, as you know, rejected the renewable energy standard, which was at the core of the Biden climate proposal. Now, look, we have no idea what it's going to be replaced with, but we do know whatever it's going to be is going to be small potatoes. They're only allocating $300 billion for whatever the climate piece ends up being. Now, look at this. As Ryan Grimm put it, that dollar amount with no real way of tackling utility emissions is effectively climate denialism. Here's hoping Bill Gates figures out that whole dimming the sun thing, I guess. Now, there's a lot to say about all of this. The first and most pressing thing to say is that progressives must reject this proposal and be prepared to vote it down if it ultimately comes to that. It's not a close call, guys. Remember, the rallying cry of progressives throughout this whole process was no climate, no deal. And to their credit, up to this point, they have held the line. They won that first game of chicken with corporatists. They forced everyone back to the negotiating table. If they cave now, when their only clear demand was gutted like a fish, they'll be betraying their supporters and they will never be taken seriously in DC again. But as I look at this proposal holistically, more important to them not being trusted again, it seems to me that this is really a generational betrayal because it's young people, once again, who got the worst end of this dog. You're denying them the chance to go to college without being saddled with crushing debt. You're denying them the ability to afford to raise a family. You're denying them the ability to inhabit a planet that isn't catastrophically careening towards disaster. You are once again allowing corporations and those who already got theirs to rob the future from the young. 
Now, do I think progressives will actually vote this bill down? Not looking too good, guys. Pramila Jayapal, whose leadership I have praised up to this point, seems pleased as punch with this disastrous mess, outrageously claiming that, quote, all our priorities are there in some way, shape, or form. She also said this nauseating trash about Joe Biden. So the president is the inspirer. He is the closer. He is the convincer. The mediator-in-chief. The mediator-in-chief. He really is doing a phenomenal job. I don't know if I want to eat cyanide or feed it to every single member of our fucking government. <laughs> Just fucking kill me. Just fucking kill me. When I saw that, like, I wasn't surprised. No, well, let me just say this. It's always surprising to hear it, but at the same time, it's not. Because it's like you expect it out of the people. You just don't expect them to be this much of a kiss ass. You know, that's just my initial opinion on that. Um, basically, like their refusal to really pass any of these progressive legislation just goes against basic politics. You know, even if you didn't believe in this shit, like, hey, voters want this shit. Hey, give them that. Maybe they'll vote for you. Like the standard political curve goes from, hey, I like this guy. I'll vote for him to, well, he did this. So who gives a fuck? I'll just vote for him. But Biden's track started with, eh, who gives a fuck? So now your next track is, boo, you fucking suck. A fork's not going to vote for you. So this strategy right now of just, you know, playing chicken and this is just classic Democrat move right now. Like Joe Biden allowing himself, allowing himself to continually gut this infrastructure bill without getting any concrete counter argument from these conservative Dems about what they want. Think about this. Kirsten Sinema this entire time has not given an outlined or detailed plan of what she wanted and why she's against certain parts of this legislation. Not at all. That is the biggest issue. And what Joe Biden and a lot of these conservative Democrats are doing is they're trying to gut this bill and it means to appease someone who is refusing to tell them what their bottom line is. So you're getting played. Now, those watching this are saying, well, RJ, you know, you should expect, expect this from Joe Biden. He's always been this conservative Democrat. That's true. But this strategy is sucking and it's sucking and it's sucking. That's why it's a lot of times it's putting a lot of pressure all these progressive politicians in office to actually try to hold the line on this. And this is something they have to do. A lot of people on online Twitter who have made very good counter arguments against the squad, but have been supporting through this, especially through a lot of these tough times with negotiations, they said if they don't actually stand up for really this very bottom of the barrel type policies or whatever's left in this infrastructure bill, that they're going to come after them. Yeah, even so, the most die hard you know defenders of of the squad it seems i've finally been tweeting you know uh you know i like the guy i'm not trying to dunk on him but even you know the serfs were tweeting like oh there's no way that the squad's gonna vote for this bill and and i you know I'm, i you know i feel bad because i'm like this is just immense naivete right and and the other part of me it feels like you know after watching this whole thing go down right and feeling like i was crazy for thinking that you know there was nothing no chance that anything good was going to come and i was like really wanting to believe that you know oh all this hype is for real like we always kind of in the back of our mind want to believe that something good is coming um but now i'm starting to think that this you know machiavellian bastard that we have in the white house set this all up for the fucking job and maybe not him but his advisors right here is why and and, and here's what really fucking gets to me, right? Because it's so performative. It's so theatrical. Uh, this idea that they're negotiating against themselves. They never, they had the numbers in the House, supposedly, right? 60 strong in the Progressive Caucus. That's what Premier Jayapal was saying at first. Uh, but they never forced Joe Manchin or Christian Cinema to actually vote on it. They never sent the legislation to the Senate. There was no... You know, uh, there was no time where they were like, put your money where your mouth is and vote down this three point five trillion dollar bill. You know, there was no time where they did that. It, it was just like, oh, OK, like, you know, we're going to either uh, you know, try and put up a bill that we know isn't going to be worth uh, the time of the progressives. And, you know, at least you can congratulate them, you know, and say, OK, you didn't let the worst fucking bill get over to the Senate, which would have passed and then it would have been over. But you also never forced them to put a really damn good bill over to the Senate and make Joe Manchin vote it down, make Kirsten Cinema vote it down. Uh, because that's a death sentence for their, uh, you know, political career. They're going to uh, have to listen to ad after ad after ad already, like Joe Manchin is, uh, talking about how he is devastating the American economy, talking about how West Virginia is already dead last in all these metrics. Um, you know what I mean? It, it just feels like this was their plan from the jump. So they never had to do it. Uh, yeah. And, and not only that, but Joe Manchin, if you remember, actually started out by saying that he would 
uh, go for a four trillion dollar bill, I believe, when originally what was being proposed was like 10 or six trillion even. Um, so they absolutely got played by even lowering it down to 3.5 in the first place and then letting Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Cinema basically chip it down, keep, you know, negotiating down and down and down. Of course, they weren't going to give preference to Bernie and the progressives. They were always going to give preference to Manchin Cinema and the centrists, you know, the right wing Democrats um, that are trying to kill this and trying to strip every decent provision out of it uh, again even those decent provisions themselves being total fucking compromises you know free community college for all or whatever is already a compromise from just tuition free college you know all of these provisions are themselves compromises and now we're compromising on the compromises once again and it absolutely looks like the squad all the progressives will probably capitulate on this what's your thoughts though do you think they're gonna just straight up capitulate rj um I still think the way the progressives moves all depends on Bernie Sanders. I mean, we've all seen that Politico article from like early this year. They said, hey, if we get Bernie to flip to our side, the progressives will fall in line. And for the most part, since they've came into Congress, that's been the basic strat. But what's interesting about Bernie Sanders right now is he's been very, he's put the gloves on, as some people have been saying. I'm not going to be optimistic. Like, I'm very pessimistic when it comes to Bernie Sanders and the squad. But Bernie Sanders has now started using more, I would say, pretty a lot of rhetoric against Manchin and Cinema and some other, you know, conservative Dems who won't get in line because I think the angle which Bernie is playing right now, which I believe isn't really the correct approach, but he's really drinking this juice of like pragmatic progressives of which he's trying to coin now. And his idea is that, well, I'm gonna be the responsible progressive. I'm gonna be the guy that says this is what we want and it's not too difficult. It's not too crazy, you know, it's something that basic people want. And then those radical, you know, conservative Democrats, they're the crazy ones. Like that's the argument he's trying to make. But it only works if you actually stand your ground. You know, for this amount of time we've seen cinema, she like I said before, it's even on this uh, podcast today, like she stands for nothing. Like when you ask her, she just gives you like weird milk tilt examples. She takes corporate cash all the time even from the very same industry as those bills are trying to fight against, he takes money from them. I mean, look at uh, Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin is an mf -er. I mean, he- Yeah, we actually have a really good uh, clip about Joe Manchin. We're going to play in a second to get into his insane corruption. Okay, yeah, I won't, I won't talk about that then until now. But like, um, yeah, my prediction is, uh, God, I hate being the Debbie Downer. Um, I would say they would, I would say the progressives because because the climate proposal, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of young people looking at that, they may try to fight on that, but I do feel like it would be unsuccessful. But again, it all depends on Bernie. Yeah. Know? And he literally just ran a panel discussion that was called what's in the damn bill trying to get people excited about it. Even that was that that streamed one day ago on YouTube. So Matt, that was already after it was clear that Joe Biden was thinking about something in the one point eight trillion dollar region. Uh, I, I'm thinking it looks like a capitulation all over it, but um, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, and I did want to take a quick look at this secular talk video as well. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but just this part where he basically makes a similar plea as Crystal does that these progressives have to protest this. They have to vote against it. So I want to take a look at this before we move on to our next story. Then I say hell no. Now, even if you play hardball, and this is this is where you know I change the conversation and I'm talking to my friends on the left, um, even if you play the hardball, you might only be able to get a $2.5 trillion deal, but $2.5 trillion is doable as long as there's climate in there and there's no means testing in there, and it's acceptable, and I would vote for it. Um, but now we're talking about $1.75 trillion giving away the farm, and it's honestly a joke of a bill. So this is my, my message to progressive lawmakers is don't vote for this one. If these are the terms of the deal, no way. If you played hardball, maybe there's a... If Joe Biden did the right thing and approached this the right way, there is a 20 or 30% chance he could have gotten them on $3.5 trillion. You know? I'm not naive. I know it's still not likely, even if he played politics the right way. But definitely, if you play politics the right way, I think he could get them on $2 trillion or more, $2.5 trillion, maybe $2.9 trillion. And that's a great point, too, that I want to talk about a little bit, because I think um, there's been such an effort to make 
Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin the villains here. You know, they're the ones that are preventing this. And, and in a sense, obviously, that is correct. They are quite literally the two votes preventing this bill from passing. But I don't think nearly enough blame has been, you know, passed to Joe Biden himself, you know, the president of the United States, who's and is allowing his own agenda to get totally fucking castrated um, by these fucking corporate goons. Uh, and like you said, RJ, not only is it terrible politics, not only will it hurt this country, but it's going to be dog shit for the Democratic Party in general. They're going to now lose the House and the Senate. Joe Biden will likely lose re-election or whoever they try to run at the top of the ticket in 2024 uh, because they have nothing to show for their time in power. Once again, just like with Obama, um, the first two years of having a, essentially a supermajority has been totally fucking squandered. Absolutely nothing to show for it. Again, despite the fact that people did go out and vote for them um, after being promised uh-oh, I think he's frozen. Yeah, I think Gavin froze a little bit, but he'll be coming back in in just one second. A hundred percent. And and what's crazy about Joe Biden is, and, and this is the one beef I take with Kyle, uh, or not beef, I guess, but just one slight disagreement <laughs> where he says if he played politics correctly, if he had negotiated and done, you know, gone and played fucking hardball uh, to the best of his ability as president, if he was extreme, if he was actually serious about um you know, passing a massive infrastructure bill that was going to be like his namesake piece of legislation, build back better, et cetera. Uh, I, I think absolutely he gets 3.5 trillion because here's what I would do. And and Kyle has made these points before, which is why I'm, I'm wondering why he's negotiated down to 2.5 trillion would be a good, good thing. 3.5 trillion, you get that done by sending uh, you, you, Joe Biden and you know, uh, Joe Biden, he gives up a call with AOC and then he gets up a call with another more moderate kind of Congress person uh, that's still in favor of an infrastructure bill, uh, 3.5. And, you know, he gets a guy like Ed Markey, who's been in Congress for a long time. And, you know, he just kind of gets a smittering of all these people. And he says, we're going to have a rally in West Virginia. And we're going to talk about all the good things that we're going to pass from this uh, big bill, this massive bill. Right. And he'll do kind of a big scale of what Bernie did and his why you should vote for this watered down piece of shit bill uh, video that he did with his panel, his town hall, whatever. And that will actually give people a reason to. Um, to you know put real serious pressure on joe manchin right because if you see that all of these people from all across the democratic party are putting are in west virginia and they're putting pressure on him and you know they're talking about how you know, hey manchin you better get on fucking board or we're going to be you know giving platform speaking time to the person that we say is supposed to endorse you um yeah, yeah, you just need to understand that it, it takes real serious pressure because you're always working against money, right? And money will make you talk or it will make you shut the fuck up, right? So you have to put in something that's more powerful to Joe Manchin than money. And maybe you're right. You can, you can do every single thing. And Joe uh, Manchin is willing to just lay down his career as a senator for this one piece of legislation. But you have to fucking shoot the hostage afterwards. You have to kick his ass out of fucking the Senate, right? You have to do everything you can as president. You have to you know go there all the time just to move make your point fuck every single other election get joe manchin and kirsten cinema out if they fuck you that is how you send a message and that is how you let the people know that we're actually fighting for shit that's how you get 3.5 trillion that's how you get 4 trillion there was a time where joe manchin and fucking self was saying 4 trillion if bernie had said no way i'm sticking at you know 6 trillion this is my fucking hard line we need 10 trillion i'm offering 6 60 percent is the lowest i can go for my constituents that is the bottom of the barrel deal you know, and, and then he just forces the conversation to always be talking about six. They had to they had literally had to correct uh, Jen Psaki had to correct the White House press correspondence that the three point five wasn't Bernie Sanders plan. If Bernie Sanders had been harping as much about six trillion, we, there's no way one point eight is on the conversation. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And by the way, guys, I know we've gotten a few complaints about the mic levels over the last week or two. People saying that Zach is significantly louder. So I have tried to adjust the audio a little bit, uh, but please let me know in the chat if it's adequate or if that problem is still persisting, because we do want to make sure that that is fixed. Um, did want to also shout out Andrew Matthews. Thanks so much for the 499 super chat. A pragmatist would know we cannot go another minute without Medicare for all, free public college, higher wages, UBI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, I totally agree with that. Apparently, Bernie and the progressives have taken a different path. But yeah, certainly agree with that myself. And thank you, Andrew. It is really uh, you know, funny how the like words like, you know, pragmatist have been twisted in favor of basically like doing less instead of doing more for working class people for uh, the kind of people that supported Bernie Sanders in the election and just working class people in general. But um, yeah, I did want to uh, watch this too, just because we're talking about Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema. I thought this ad in particular did a really good job 
breaking down just how fucking corrupt your salary Manchin in particular is. And again, I just think it's crazy that with all of this knowledge out there, with this being known, people like Joe Biden are still out here acting as if he's a good faith actor, acting as if he's not acting as if he's a, you know, a, a colleague and a, an honorable senator that needs to be negotiated with instead of beaten into submission. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at this. I, I think it's pretty, pretty damning. What was your salary last year? About 18 million. It pays to be a member of Joe Manchin's family. Follow the money. Joe Manchin has represented West Virginia for 40 years. Delegate, state senator, secretary of state, governor, U.S. Senator, 40 years and West Virginia is still the second poorest state in the country. Economy, West Virginia ranks 48 out of 50 states. Thank you, Joe Manchin. Healthcare, 47 out of 50 states. Thank you, Joe Manchin. Education, 45 out of 50 states. Thank you, Joe Manchin. Infrastructure, wait for it, 50 out of 50 states. Manchin has an estimated net worth of 8 million. Follow the money. While the average annual income of West Virginia is just 26,000. Manchin receives a taxpayer paid salary as a U.S. Senator of $184,500. So he didn't get his $8 million there. Nice yacht, Joe. So where does all the money come from? Manchin receives $491,000 annually from his son's coal brokerage company, Enter Systems. His wife, Gail Manchin, receives $613,000 from Enter Systems. That's $1.1 million to Manchin and his wife from his family's energy company. Manchin makes five times more from his family's energy company than he does as a U.S. Senator. Joe Manchin has blocked President Biden's infrastructure plan from moving forward because he wants to kill legislation to replace coal-fired plants with clean energy. Manchin is selling out his own country to protect big coal and big oil who own him. Joe Manchin, I talk to his office every week. Um, he is the kingmaker, uh, and, and he's not shy about sort of staking his claim early. The chairman of the committee that regulates coal shouldn't be a part owner of a coal company. This is Heather Manchin, Joe Manchin's daughter. After lying about having an MBA, she was named CEO of Mylan Industries. She artificially jacked up the price of EpiPens by 461% and was awarded with a 671% salary increase. West Virginia is poor, poorly educated, and broken, but Joe Manchin and his entire family have become multimillionaires. West Virginia, abused and suckered for 40 years by Joe Manchin. And that's not a Republican ad, by the way. That's an ad uh, by and from a Democrat um, company or ad ad company, whatever you want to call it. These are uh, Democrat-leaning um, producers. So it's not like they're coming after him from a right-wing perspective. This is people in the Democratic establishment that are sick and tired and fed up of this man and his corruption. And again, I just think it's insane that President Biden, who's uh, whose agenda this is, is not out here pointing these things out on a daily basis. You know, he should be fucking retweeting this ad. You know what I'm saying? He should be out here talking and drilling into people's heads just how corrupt Joe Manchin is and saying that, no, obviously we're not going to negotiate with this corruption. We're not going to destroy our bill to appease this fucking monster. Yeah, it should end. That fucking ad would be way more powerful if it ended with, I'm Joe Biden. And, oh, wait, what were we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is honestly like this doesn't really surprise me as much because this is old school politics. Like if you look at Joe Manchin's entire political career, as long as well as his connections with the corporate industry. I mean, this is basically historic. I mean, you have to look back to like the 1950s and 60s when you had different uh, politicians that go up as state senators. They meet different people, have all these type of connections. They've had businesses back in the day, meet with different corporate industries. I mean, this is all old money. This is what it is, old money. And old money has connections and old money is a tied, a tied to politics. So when you have a guy like Joe Manchin, has, he's literally actually went up the chain in politics. You know, state senator, secretary of state, governor, senator. Like, this is the reason why he has so much power in this entire state. So if he didn't have that much power in the entire state, he wouldn't be as difficult to fight, at, fight really on a national stage. Because when push comes to shove, if he gets any type of negative heat nationally, he can just sit happy at home knowing he has the entire state up behind his back. So if so, it's really the strategy that Bernie Sanders wanted to do in terms of going into West Virginia and telling the voters, hey, this is what this is what your senator is doing wrong and making this very public and very clear 
that everything outlined in that video of infrastructure, healthcare, all those types of issues, your state is basically dead last. That could be very helpful for turning that turning that thing around. And also like Joe Biden has the power too as a president, not just, you know, with the powers of the president because of the office and how powerful it is to influence legislation to bring about certain types of changes in the state of West Virginia, which will make Joe Manchin look bad. Because you have to think of it this way. You as a voter in West Virginia, you can't get your senator to, to pass certain legislation to get you any pluses in your own state, yet the president of the United States does it with the snap of a finger. Your ass is gone. You know, like look at our look at our governor in our state. Like we got like I believe ten percent, like a lot of the money that's being allocated in the infrastructure package is gonna be given towards Michigan for our roads and our bridges. So that type of politics itself would be very helpful in terms of really fighting against Joe Manchin because he does have a lot of power. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. And also shout out to Blair Walsingham in the chat. Good to see you there. One of my favorite congressional candidates from the 2020 cycle base candidate in Tennessee. So super happy to see you in the chat, Blair. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, but yeah, Zach is back. Um, but, but yeah, one more video on this infrastructure bill that I want to go over. I promise we're going to move on here in just a second to the Twitter drama that I know you're also anxious to see. Uh, but let's take a this look. Shit this shit is important, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's take a look at this. Um, uh, recently, Joe Biden did a town hall, I guess it was yesterday, on CNN with Anderson Cooper. And this was one of the answers that I thought was pretty pathetic. Uh, and we can talk about why. But, yeah, let's take a look at this and we can react. A lot a lot of those details. Just though, are you close to a deal? I think so. You know, look, I've been a, I was a senator for 370 years. <laughs> and uh, I was never I, I was relatively good at putting together deals. Is this the toughest deal you've worked on? No, no. I think banning assault weapons is the toughest deal I worked on and yeah. succeeded. You're flying, you're flying to Europe, I think, in eight days. Yes. Do you think you'll have a deal by the time you get on Air Force One well, in eight look, days? you know, it's like my asking you, are you sure your next show is going to be a success? Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, you're more confident than I am. Look, <laughs> look, it's all about compromise. You know, These jokes compromise being rehearsed. become a dirty word, but it's <laughs> bipartisanship and compromise still has to be possible. When I ran for the president, a lot of I those thought that was pretty... Uh, Oops, I cut it off. But that was particularly ridiculous where he says bipartisanship and compromise is still essential. It's like there is no bipartisanship going on. None of the Republicans are down with this. None of them are going to vote for it. Uh, the only, you know, negotiating compromise that's happening is within the fucking Democratic Party. You can't even get your own caucus together. You can't even get the Democratic Party on board with your agenda and whip the votes necessary. Uh, so this has nothing to do with compromise or bipartisanship. It has to do with your inability to lead your fucking party. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's fucking ridiculous. And it, look, uh, I just want to comment on RJ's comment. Now, every joke that Joe Biden makes sounds rehearsed because he's been rehearsing them all for like fifty fucking years. He only has three jokes. Uh, but <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's crazy that this guy is the president too. Do you ever just look at him and think, like, holy shit, he's like so not there? Like that. I, I watched another moment of that uh, t town hall last night where he literally just can't answer the question for like ten seconds. He just holds his hands really tight. Like, ah, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I I I, th I think that if he's anywhere close to a bill, like he said he was at the beginning, anywhere close to reaching a deal, then it's going to be a disastrous deal. Yeah, it's going to be absolute dog shit, and it's just it's just crazy how how cucked the so called progressive left has become in this whole negotiation. Again, I totally think they're going to fold and vote for this thing. They're not going to uh, actually have a backbone as they should, but we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, thanks so much, Will, for the five bucks. Let's go, Brandon. One hundred percent. Fuck Joe Biden. Uh, one of the fucking worst presidents of all time. Yeah, just a do nothing piece of shit, really. Which is just fucking obvious that he was going to be because he's got no cognitive brain function left. But it seems like the people who are running the show from behind the scenes are are actually pretty efficient at you know screwing the people out of absolutely everything. So that's really a dismal prospect. Yeah, just today, Neera Tandon is slowly removing up the ranks in the White House. She We're going to talk about that too. Secretary. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well, which is which is so funny. But yeah, I did want to move on to this um, Twitter spat between Brianna Joy Gray, who, like I said, just almost every day just pissing off people on Twitter. It's, it's pretty funny to watch. She's seemingly always at war with kind of the you know elite blue check liberals on Twitter, which, again, I find 
highly entertaining. Uh, but let's take a look at this because actually Richie Torres was on MSNBC and he had some interesting words to say about Joe Biden that I want to play uh, as context before we get into Brianna's response and the Twitter war that that followed subsequently. But yeah, let's take a look at this original MSNBC clip to see where it all started and to see if the representative from New York's 15th district had anything of merit to say. Let, let's let's take a look at this, guys. Progressive Caucus is enormously grateful to President Biden, who's emerged as the most progressive president in the history of the United States. Uh, he's a man on a mission. He's intent on passing not one, but two of the largest infrastructure investments in American history. And the purpose of the meeting was to impress upon members of Congress a sense of urgency around landing these planes as swiftly and as smoothly as we can. The most the progressive, progressive president in the history of the United States. Forget FDR, LBJ, or anyone else. Joe fucking Biden is the most progressive uh, president in the history of the United States. Absolutely laughable. And shout out to Case Study QB, as always, for posting this uh, absolutely hilarious t clip on Twitter. Uh, really valuable resource for everyone to follow. Yeah, it reminds me of a piece that I did, I think for our Substack, it may have been back when we were doing a blog still, I can't fucking remember, but Matt Iglesias literally had two different fucking pieces for Vox News, where it was one of them was like, Joe Biden is poised to be the most progressive president of all time. And then he wrote another piece where he was like, Joe Biden never called himself a progressive. It was like the ultimate fucking head fake. This is the big energy that I get from that. This like Vox kind of neoliberalism where, you know, it, wherever whatever you're doing, you are running cover for Joe Biden. You are simping for Joe Biden. Like he could give you, you know, a licked Cheeto and a kick in the nuts and he would be like, thank you so much. I can't believe I got that licked Cheeto. I was so hungry. It fed me so good. Wow. Never needed any more Cheetos because I just got a licked Cheeto. Yeah, it seems like this new strategy by a lot of these, you know, progressive Democrats is they're trying to do the same strategy that, the old, you know, Republican Trumpers did for Trump. You know, they start kissing Trump's ass. Oh, you're the greatest ever. Like, they're trying to find ways to get on his good side so that Biden will let them in and hopefully give them something or give them something personal. But the difference between Biden and Trump is it says Trump will use you and spit you out for your popularity. And then, like, as soon as you're not beneficial to him, he'll let you go. Biden just doesn't give a fuck. He says, well, fuck you. You know, hey, you do what I want or get the fuck on. So they, I'm pretty sure it's surprising they haven't figured that out yet. But if they want to keep making themselves just like, like idiots and cucks, then, hey, whatever makes them feel good. And, you know, Richie Neal, I mean, what's that? What's the guy Richie, Richie Torres. Torres? Yeah. Richie Torres. Yeah, he looks like your stereotypical, you know, cuck. So, <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I say about that. Like that whole like spiel he was giving, I'm just like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, it's like, just dog who shit. are these people? Like we keep finding out about these asshole losers, like when they say something stupid, like. It reminds me of that Conor McGregor meme, like, who the fuck is that guy? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah, 100%. 100%. And to demonstrate uh, the this dude's, you know, tendencies, let's take a look at this Twitter exchange, which followed. Because uh, in response to that clip, which we just played of Richie Torres, Brown and Joy Gray, you know, sarcastically quote tweets and says, I mean, we did get Juneteenth referring to the fact that Biden, under the Biden administration, um, Juneteenth is now a federally recognized holiday. So again, she's mocking him and just saying, yeah, we only got, we've only got performative, um, essentially meaningless, symbolic wins from Biden, nothing serious, nothing substantive, nothing lasting, et cetera. So, you know, pretty innocuous mocking Richie for that hilarious response on MSNBC calling Joe Biden the most progressive president in the history of the United States, which even if you like Joe Biden more than we do here at the Vanguard, I, I just think it's laughably inaccurate, just straight up not factual to say that. Uh, Dwight so, Eisenhower was more progressive than yeah, Joe Biden. Exactly. Oh, you forgot something, too. There's one more else thing that they gave us, too. Like uh, right after Juneteenth was passed, you can't forget that old Jim Clyburn saying, let every let every voice sing the uh, Black National Anthem. So you got to give them props for that. Like we love to see that. <laughs> Right. Was, oh my God, it was fucking awful. I wanted to shoot myself. <laughs> you cannot sing. Oh my God. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. But again, he did not take kindly to this to this joke. He responds and says, "What about ending a twenty-year, two-trillion-dollar forever war, cutting child poverty by fifty percent, advancing a five-trillion-dollar agenda for America? None of these are sufficiently progressive for you." And just to address the substance here, yes, it was good that Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, uh, but it's not like he's 
in any way going to war with the Pentagon or the military industrial complex. The you know Pentagon budget has only increased under Biden and in, in quite significantly um, cutting child poverty by 50 percent. I think that's laughable to say. I, I don't think that that was actually achieved um, with the last you know bill that was passed by Biden uh, advancing a five trillion dollar agenda for America. You know, th- I don't see that happening really either, except for for the military. So, you know, total total simping from Richie. Um, and she responds and says child poverty shouldn't exist and having it shouldn't be temporary. Yeah, again, the, the what he's referring to is the temporary child tax credit. Um, climate provisions are being slashed as the world burns. Again, giving Joe Manchin preference in the climate part of the Build Back Better negotiation, someone who literally makes his more money from dirty energy from coal in West Virginia than he does from being a senator. Um, the minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2009, the longest in the history of America, by the way, uh, since we've had a minimum wage increase. And the infrastructure bills you're bragging advancing aren't final, but good job on Afghanistan. So, yeah, I guess good job on Afghanistan. Yeah. But that's her response. Did you want to say something? Sorry? Oh, just that it's a fucking joke that it only cost us $2 trillion in Afghanistan. Like, you get your head out of your ass, guy. Like, that that cost us a shit ton more money uh, ending a 20-year $2 trillion forever war. I, th- I think a more accurate count is something like fucking $20 trillion was what was spent on the war on terror broadly, uh, which is all fucking ushered through under the same pretenses of Afghanistan, and that's not gone anywhere. So, of course, it is good that we're not applying daily routine terror to the lives of the Afghan people uh but we're still doing that shit elsewhere so let's not pat ourselves on the back too hard might break our spines yeah i had to read that thread about two or three times because like rich like uh, richie torres got a lot of likes and retweets on that i'm like am i missing something here like is there a reason why he's like actually ratioing brie joy in this it's because they suck their own dick yeah, it's because there's a shit ton of, you know, blue check style liberals on Twitter that love to defend Joe Biden and they get super triggered by Brianna Joy Gray, who, of course, is not above criticism. I'm not saying that, like, it's not fair to criticize her, but she does really seem to piss off these type of people that just love running cover for the establishment, uh, even when they're very clearly failing at their most basic tasks. So. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It. Um, but this isn't over. This continues. It's only it's only starting to get as intense as it will. Um, let's take a look at his response. He says, in your view, Biden is not progressive for failing to abolish child poverty overnight amid over. OK, he didn't fucking abolish child poverty. You're going to tell me that there's no Christ. children uh, that are going to bed hungry in this country anymore. You're going to tell me that everything is fine now. Fuck off, dude. Anyway. Biden is not progressive for failing to abolish child poverty overnight amid overwhelming obstruction obstructionism from the filibuster, which, by the way, he refuses to deal with um, the Republican Party and conservative Democrats with veto power. The obstructionists, not Biden, should be blamed for their obstruction. And before I get to Brianna's response, my response is that the buck stops with the president. He's the fucking president. He has the Senate and the House. It's his job to whip the obstructionists into fucking shape. It's his job. Yeah, you're 100 percent right on this. I mean, if I mean, let's just do apples to apples here. So, what do I hear from establishment shit libs all the time? Oh, Biden is going to be the SDR. And then it's oh, Biden's going to be the LBJ. Well, if we're going to talk about LBJ, like in order to pass the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of '64 and '65, uh, back then uh, LBJ had to get had to not only had to get votes from the Republican Party and also had to strangle some votes for his own party. So, like you have to do that as president to get yeah, what you want. 100%. Like there's this famous picture of uh lbj with uh what's his name dick russell of uh georgia and he literally got in his face and said if you don't follow if you don't follow the line i'm gonna crush you yeah so i yeah. mean you're gonna have type of uh i would say obstructionist in your own party it's how you deal with them and how you work around them like right. there, there's gonna be some times where they're gonna be immovable but you got to find a way to crush them by moving around them and, and joe hasn't even do tried it. he hasn't even gone out there and called joe Manchin corrupt it's not like he's out there on tv saying my agenda is being held up by this corruption. Let's take a look at these numbers. Let's see how much exactly Joe Biden is making from the coal industry, from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, this is why he's obstructing. It's not like Biden's out there doing anything about this. He's 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 happily you know negotiating downwards in Joe in Joe Manchin's direction. He's happily bending the knee to this corrupt senator uh, because let's be honest. Joe Manchin is actually doing what Joe Biden wants him to do. Of course, Joe Biden doesn't actually want to pass a $3.5 trillion bill. Joe Biden would much rather pass a $1.75 trillion bill with all the good shit gutted from it. Of course, that's because, you know, Joe Manchin is the rotating villain along with Kirsten Sinema. Uh, they're, they're playing the part 
of of the obstructionist to get down the bill to what it actually should be in the eyes of the democratic establishment and the oligarchy which the democratic establishment is essentially a puppet of so you know that's what's going on here just in case any of you motherfuckers are as stupid as richie torres but uh, let's take a look at brianna joy gray's response to that she says You've introduced a straw man to obscure the extent to which you're begging for plaudits from progressives on Twitter for doing your job. My job is to push you to do better. Your job is to log off and fight for what majorities of Americans want, even if corporate donors disagree. So absolutely, you know, on the on the head, on the nail from Brianna Joy Gray here, um, just really articulating this perfect it's like richie torres is an elected representative of new york's 15th district this is a federal employee whose job it is to fight for the needs of his constituents not to run cover for the biden administration and one of their most embarrassing moments is they totally fail to hold the line and again like i said bend the knee to corruption um it's not his job to do anything else and it's crazy that he's out here, you know, battling Brianna Joy Gray, who's just making sensible points, trying to, you know, um, make the left flank points against what's going on. And, and instead of doing his goddamn job and fighting for this bill in its real true form, Richie Torres is out here fucking arguing with her. Yeah, and let's not forget the fact that I, I don't know. Imagine I, I can't say for sure. Uh, that Richie Torres was uh, cheerleading Trump's immigration policies as a, you know, uh, fierce, uh, you know, Democratic fucking defender. Right. When Trump was in office, I'm sure he was raising hell about how it was completely all villainous and fascist and how, he, oh, my God, it's heartbreaking what's happening at the border. Not only does Richie Torres not have fucking dick to say about Joe Biden set to expand and continue trump's remain in mexico policy right and continue it after november when it was supposed to end he's gonna go ahead and make that firm policy nobody's fucking talking about that right it's completely outside of the discussion right now even though this was something that the media was melting down about rightfully so when it was happening under trump it's not even part of the purview right it's like it's not even happening when joe biden does it oh that's a necessity we can't have unlimited immigration we have to have some bipartisanship with the republicans all that kind of fucking horseshit no he is literally maintaining trump era policies that you told us all of these fucking blue check liberals said were the most life-threatening policies of all time now of course these these i massively disagree with joe biden's immigration policy and i'm happy to say it every single goddamn day these motherfuckers like richie torres want to pretend that oh everything's fine now we're treating people with humanity no we're not we're literally violating the constitution by not allowing asylum seekers to remain in um, america as their asylum requests a process that's a violation of one of the most fundamental rights we have declared we will offer the world as a country it's like the only fucking good thing we can do we fuck up the whole world and we're like all right well if you've got a good case you can wait here for a little bit while we figure out if we're gonna let you stay or give you the boot like it's like the one thing we actually did okay and, and, and now it's off the table we're not doing it anymore yeah i mean you're right too like the mainstream media is you know failure to cover any of these issues accurately i mean you see how like you see how fucking Don Lemon treated Joe Rogan, you know, like literally like I, I watched the entire Joe Rogan, like sorry to go off track here, but it's just like media as well, too. Like I've seen the entire interview of like Joe Rogan with Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I thought it was very insightful. Like You all should watch it. And then that fucking egghead Don Lemon goes on TV and talks about like ivermectin that way. It's completely terrible. And I'm just like, what the hell? Like they did, literally had an interview about this. And they're still slandering this guy. And like also too, like mainstream media, where they talk about Donald Trump's new social media app, Truth or whatever. And by the way, the stock price went from like $2 to like nearly $200 a share. So everything is a distraction now, nowadays, specifically about this. So that, that's what's very, that's very disheartening because then people can't really understand what's really the truth about what's going on in America. Yeah, totally agree. And I absolutely agree about Don Lemon as well. It's, it's fucking hilarious that they can't just admit that they were obviously wrong in that instance on CNN and they should just have issued an apology and tried to move on instead of you know keep doubling down it's fucking it's fucking pathetic um but yeah there is more to this twitter exchange that i want to get to um again she has a pretty epic response here but it's not over richie comes back with again for some reason he's spending his goddamn morning doing this instead of fucking anything to help his constituents uh, he says i encourage you to run for public office and perform the magic tricks you expect from biden and others i have no doubt that you will abolish child poverty and usher in progressive utopia the moment you arrive run brianna run uh so 
just being a sarcastic piece of shit essentially and being like oh you don't, you want nice things well why don't you fucking get them like why are you demanding more of people that are in power and that are literally paid hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars to supposedly advance the you know causes which would help their communities how dare you ask for nice things uh so yeah what a sarcastic piece of shit she responds with loading i'll keep that in mind when i move back home to ny i have always loved the bronx so you know a funny response and you know hinting that perhaps she might you know run for office perhaps in the bronx where i believe richie torres uh represents so you know maybe a little bit of a veiled threat there what, what's your response to that rj yeah i mean in terms of free joy i mean you know so it definitely be better than uh, Richie Torres. Richie Torres, that'll be for sure. You know, mm -hmm. Richie Torres, he's just trying to be the next uh, Clyborne to quarantine that Joe Biden likes. That's what it seems like, in my opinion, you know, but I don't know. I mean, these politicians, I mean, you see the pattern, you know, it's kind of impossible to see it nowadays. Like that, that's always a straw man. Oh, well, you're blaming us. No, why don't you run? And it's just like, no, like you literally could just take the strategies we give you that's literally easy as hell and actually do it yourself. And it's, and you you could be successful, but no, you don't want to hurt your friend who's from another, you know, congressperson or state. Oh, you're too concerned about what Uncle Joe may say. Oh, you're too concerned about what, you know, Mama Bear Nancy Pelosi will do to your political career. So it, it's just all pathetic. But, you know, I never knew who this guy was until like two weeks ago. So that's probably sad. But at the same time, it just shows you how like terrible he is, too. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, God, I, I might be just barking up the wrong tree, but I, I think I would like to see Brianna Joy Gray get into a fiery primary uh, contest in the in, in the Bronx, because I, I think one, I, I'm pretty sure she's from New York uh, or at least lived there for a long period of time. So it's not really like carpet bagging. I, I am normally not a fan of people who move somewhere and then run for office. But she'd be doesn't... moving back home to right, New York. exactly going back home to serve the like where she's from which obviously that that's completely different uh and also I, I think it would just i think she's always been one of the most um capable articulators of uh, progressive ideas of uh progressive solutions uh you know really breaking it down into a digestible understandable ironclad argument right like we've said it all the time obviously you know rj gavin we were all big supporters of the force the vote movement but i think brianna joy gray did some of the best commentary on forcing people to recognize no pun intended, forcing people to understand the necessity of it she has that great piece that uh, i tweeted out the other day from the vanguard account called um uh on litmus test and in defense of litmus test i believe is what it's called it's a current affairs piece uh fuck current affairs and nathan j robinson but that's a damn good piece uh you should read it uh but it, i i just think that it would be something that would be uh, a candidate that the progressive movement could sink their teeth into she has never once um you know really fallen on the wrong side of, of something that i thought was a deeply uh, already understood progressive issue obviously i don't agree with her on like a hundred percent of her takes right we, we had differences of agreement especially like recently but I, I think that overall, she's one of the last true bastions, that one of the last true holdouts with serious clout, with serious experience from the Bernie movement. And, you know, while I think that there's obviously the opportunity for her to go in and disappoint her, like, or disappoint us like Nina Turner did when she ran for office, uh, you know, biting her tongue, you know, uh, pacifying herself. I don't think she'll do any of those things. But, you know, obviously the possibility stands that she could. Uh, I, I think that what she could really do is bring some fire to somebody like Rishi Torres. She could tell the people of the Bronx what they could have. Uh, really, really take the energy that AOC was supposed to bring and actually like, you know, use and wield that power. When we had her on our show, we asked her if she would be opposed to running for office. She said no. Uh, she didn't seem like it was something that she was particularly like itching to do, but perhaps that's changed. Uh, I'd love to see it. Yeah. Oh, I, me pers oh, you're good, RJ. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll say me personally, like, yeah, uh, Bree Joy is definitely a profile, profile person, very bright, very intelligent in politics. Me personally, I feel like she's best suited outside the game in terms of punching at the politicians like she says she's doing on her show. Like she brings in, she talks to many different people about many different topics. And really that type of information she has on her show is flows in different ways across the political spectrum, which is very beneficial. You know, and also too, in terms of her being a high profile candidate, we have to think of it this way. Well, like AOC and a lot of these other squad members came in, they weren't that very prominent. So they were able to sneak in a little bit and actually get those type of victories. And once you're in, it's nearly impossible to get out. Like, look at the incumbents. Like, I believe, what, 98% of incumbents in Congress, like, get reelected? So that you have it that way. But look at the Nina Turner route. Look at potentially the Bree Joy route. Like, they're very prominent people. Like, the establishment's going to see them coming. So it's going to yeah. be very difficult to really fight against them. You know they're going to have corporate cash go against them the entire way. So for me, 
would she have the best chance out of even probably Nina as well? Yes. But in terms of really the type of corporate influence and type of really largely uphill fight that she would face, I think it would be very difficult due to her national profile. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, I'm just terrified of seeing what would happen to her if she were to get into electoral politics after seeing what's happened to so many others, including Nina Turner. You know, it seems like they just, you know, go downhill. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the risk that you run with anybody that gets a high public profile. I mean, you know, I, I guess there, there are some true real ones that, that, you know, can stick it out, right? Mike Ravel is the hero that we always like to look for, read the Pentagon Papers in uh, from as a senator of Alaska, you know? So, uh, I mean, every once in a while, there there is a great shark, because Hunter Thompson famously coined the term. Uh, I think Gavin has something in his eye, so we'll just wait on for a second. But yeah, I, I, I think that I think that Brianna Joy Gray, the only I think that there's so much truth in what you're saying is that she's impeccable from the outside, throwing bombs, challenging the system, filleting politicians, holding other journalists accountable, right? People who go and, you know, have, you know, questionable reporting on something. She's really good at breaking it apart. She's an attorney or uh, a lawyer, at least, and, you know, uh, credentials. And I think that a lot of times that that comes through that she's, you know, educated in law and she just has that kind of ruthlessness with her arguments uh, that I think, you know, comes from the training of, of uh you know, getting your juris doctorate or whatever the fuck. Um, but yeah, Gavin, did you have any more thoughts now that you're... Oh yeah, sorry about that. I had an eyelash in my eye. I'm not I'm not crying, guys. I apologize. But uh, I did want to shout out Dana's comment here. It's unbelievable that Richie Torres is a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. It absolutely is unbelievable. And I think it's, you know, this is why the, the quote-unquote left flank is being so pathetic right now, refusing to call out Joe Biden. They're out here simping for this agenda instead of challenging, instead of castigating him for not mounting a, a you know, a more intense... Uh, intimidable defense of his own goddamn agenda. So, yeah, I just think it's I just think it's crazy that the progressive progressive caucus is filled with so many just spineless losers like Richie Torres that refuse to even pretend to be a left flank. They're not even pretending to be a left flank anymore. They're literally just out here apologizing and defending Joe Biden's inaction on national television. It's it's absolutely insane to me. Um, so yeah, but we can move on there's a couple more stories wanted to cover in particular um, another progressive aoc she took to twitter actually sorry instagram the other day i believe it may have been twitter as well um to castigate joe biden for his in just kidding she didn't do that at all she went on instagram live to do this okay so i very often try to record a little day in the life for you all but I usually am not able to because I try, then the day gets too busy. I can't film myself narrating the thing and do the thing. Anyways, today I'm gonna to try to change that because First Lady Jill Biden is coming to visit right here in the Bronx, our district, PS83, and I'm the Congresswoman to receive her today. So what does that look like? The first thing I needed to do this morning was that I needed to go to a clinic and get a COVID test that was witnessed and administered by a medical professional. And so I didn't get to film that, but I did take a picture of this because look at the flyer. <laughs> the wall. Okay, I had a couple of legislative calls preparing for hearings next week, and now I need to pick out what to wear. So what should I wear? Um, pink, checkered, pink suit, blue dress, or this? Okay, so I have no idea if this is actually going to work. Day in the life of a revolutionary leftist. <laughs> Dude, she looks like an Instagram influencer, 100%. It's like, remember when we, Gavin and I went to Boulder the other day. We drove down to Boulder and we were just uncomfortably drinking beers, looking around, being like, holy shit, everybody in Boulder, Colorado looks like an internet influencer. We're just these like regular motherfuckers from Kansas. Like I'm wearing sweatpants and not giving a fuck. And like everybody else is like polished and put together and posh and like, you know, out to be presentable in public i feel like that's where aoc belongs and a socialist revolutionary belongs in the other group that i just described the regular people in kansas city that still you know do fucking jobs and you know hang out or whatever uh, watching this video makes me want to shoot myself man this is just terrible it, it's it's the okay I, uh, it's depressing at the same time like why fucking why jesus christ i mean at the end of the day they're democrats so you know this is this is to be expected. The cuckery, making yourself look like an idiot. So I don't know. It's just it's depressing. I yeah. Mean, it, oh. oh, I was just gonna say like there's not really much more else to say than this is the completion of the evolution, right? It is 
voting present on the Iron Dome. It is showing up to the Met Gala. It is entertaining Jill Biden as if it's a fucking honor. Are you kidding me? Like, I get you got fucking jobs to do when you're AOC. And if you got to show up to some shit and receive Jill Biden, whatever, you're playing a fucking card game with these motherfuckers. And maybe you have to, like, put on a nice face for the afternoon. I'm not going to go out and bust your chops because you took a picture standing next to the lady. But don't go out and make a fucking uh, documentary. Four minute how, long video. Yeah. Yeah. About how you're fucking so excited. You have to go get glitched and glammed up. And don't worry, everybody. Unlike the grandpa Facebook conspiracy theories, I'm just a regular person. Look at how I get dolled up to go fucking receive the first lady. It's just it's super cringy. It's out of touch. It, it, it is the furthest thing from what people wanted from AOC. When she started giving these updates, it was all castigating the system. Oh, my God. Can you believe you have to raise this much money to be on this committee? And, oh, they're going to screw you out of your fucking committee seats if you don't raise more money from big donors this is how the swamp works guys like that the complete change that like three like like, i don't even know 180 doesn't seem justifiable enough though that is a complete turnaround like you know what i mean she is the neoliberal she's become an obama type character in american politics it's just what it is she's a celebrity now and she is completely without fangs she is a dog with no bark or bite anymore yeah Yeah, i like the i like the tan dress though yeah, hundred percent. Speaking of dresses, during this part of the video, Where? which is um, uh, looking through her dresses, checkered. I was, I was, I was expecting. I was looking for the tax the rich, rich dress. You know, where is it? Why is it not in her uh, her closet? Should have worn dress. that dress. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, uh, jokes aside, I did think there's a pretty good response to this on Twitter that I wanted to share. Again, AOC posted this on Twitter as well about how excited she is to welcome the first lady to the Bronx. Um, and, and this response, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I follow Jessica Grace, but probably should. She says, why are you presenting Jill Biden to your community when the administration refuses to do anything substantial to support your community and in fact has done several things to directly harm your constituents? Like why clean her image to your constituents? And that's so fucking true. Like, during the primary, which, by the way, wasn't even that fucking long ago, the, the Democratic primary, um, AOC was out here talking about how it's insane that her and Joe Biden are even in the same party, you know, pointing out how crazy it is that in America we have a two party system, you know, and that people like AOC, who at the time was pretending to be a radical leftist, have to be, you know, cohorting with the likes of Joe Biden, who's obviously a totally corrupt, bought off, you know, corporate shill. Um, now she's out here. Like Jessica says, cleaning the image of the Joe Biden administration for her very constituents, the people that most desperately need the you know help, which the Joe Biden administration could deliver. And again, it's not just this bill. There's a myriad of issues which Joe Biden could, with the snap of his fingers, enact the legalization of cannabis, for example, something that affects, uh, you know, poor and working class people all around the country. Uh, another example would be student loan debt. Pretty sure AOC's constituents, quite a few of them, would really benefit from that. And Joe Biden, every single day when he wakes up, decides that he's not going to forgive that student loan debt. So why are you pointing that out? Why aren't you on Instagram pointing it out? All of Joe Biden's failures, all of the failures of this neoliberal corporate establishment, which not even a year or so ago, you were pretending uh, that we needed a revolution to counter. Yeah, 100 yep. percent. Right. And just a quick shout out to Dieter McBusiness. Thank you for the super chat. And then RJ, I'll let you take the wheel. AOC is a classic example of what can happen to someone who comes from humble beginnings and extends offense to the elite class she can't handle success yeah exactly this was one of the things we were talking about with the met gala deal uh aoc was shown the life she could be have she could have if she decided to be an asset to the establishment instead of a fucking thorn in their side she chose the role of the asset it's clear as day uh and she's being rewarded uh and she'll continue to be as she continues to throw all of her constituents and working people under the fucking bus uh, by not being what she claimed to be. Uh, and no, I don't care that she's way better than Donald Trump on so many issues. I wasn't supporting Donald Trump either. Like, that's the straw man these people have. It's like, oh, well, would you su- prefer you get, you know, fucking Joe Manchin in the, or, you know, would you, you know, whoever. It, fuck you. No, I wouldn't prefer that. But I would also prefer a- AOC to stand by her ethics and not compromise and fold as soon as she got a taste of the good life. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, obviously this applies to a lot of the 
uh, progressives in Congress. I think this applies to Cory Bush, for example, as well. Um, but I think it's undeniable that AOC is just so much more cringy than her colleagues, like just with this video that she just gives people so much ammunition to to roast her and point out her you know, descent into elitism. So uh, that's why we're, we're talking about it. But yeah, thanks Dieter for the 499. Really appreciate that and totally agree as well. Uh, but yeah, did you have anything else to say about this, RJ? Oh yeah, I was gonna say if AOC was a true politician, if she was had an, she should have requested an audience with the first lady and actually whisper into her ear, "Hey, uh, can you do this for me? Can you influence the president in any type of way?" I mean, it's been done before. I mean, please, every type of rinky dink senator when they ask the administration or they can't get a, a line directly to the president, they go to the first lady, "Hey, what can you do for me?" And often enough, okay, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. What you gonna do for me then? So the failure of attempts to do these type of old school political uh, handouts and handshakes is really revealing, like to just allow yourself to continually be cucked and be used and not get anything in return like that. Like they're not getting anything in return. They're just willing to be used. So that's well, the only thing in return is, you know, the public fame, the public image. You know, that's that's it. But like nothing of substance. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent, RJ. Um, I did want to move on to one last story that we have to talk about today as you Referenced earlier in the show, RJ, um, Neera Tandon has been named the White House Staff Secretary. The former nominee to serve as White House Budget Director will keep her current title as Senior Advisor to the President. Let's take a look at this Politico article. Neera Tandon, a Senior Advisor to President Joe Biden, was named White House Staff Secretary Friday, nearly eight months after the White House pulled her nomination to serve as director of the Office of Management and Budget. The staff secretary role is the central nervous system of the White House and proves and moves the decision-making process and manages a wide variety of issues for the president, a White House official told Politico. Nira has over two decades of experience in policy and management, which are critical elements of the role. Her experience across domestic, economic, and national security policy will be a key asset in this new role. Tandon's selection as staff secretary was First reported by the Washington Post, in addition to her new duties, Tandon will keep her senior advisor title and will continue to provide leadership on particular projects and initiatives, the White House said. She will report to Chief of Staff Ron Klain. Um, Biden initially tapped Tandon, who pre previously was president of the powerful think tank Center for American Progress, to serve as his White House budget chief last November. But Senate Republicans quickly lined up against Tandon's nomination, citing her history of combative tweets targeting GOP politicians and policies. Tandon, a close ally of Hillary Clinton, also encountered opposition from some members of the Democratic Party's progressive wing due to her critical comments about Bernie Sanders, uh, chair of the Senate uh, committee charged with overseeing her confirmation. Um, obviously, also Joe Manchin announced he would not back her. One of the only good things Joe Manchin has done, uh, <laughs> cementing Biden's first defeat in the battle to confirm his cabinet pick. So basically, you know, because she couldn't actually get through the process of, you know, being voted the office and man or the director of the office and managed budget, um, she's now just been awarded this position undemocratically by Joe Biden to keep her on the payroll, essentially, uh, as a thank you for all of the shit talking she's done on Twitter uh, towards progressives like Bernie Sanders and basically running cover for the elite Democratic establishment, Hillary Clinton, et cetera. Oh, you're muted. Oh, yeah, I was just saying go for it. But yeah, no, uh, oh, 100 percent. Yeah. yeah, uh I can take it first. If, uh, yeah, basically, uh, Neera Tandon is the attack dog for the clinton world right she is the fucking rabid always online um fucking villain that they use as like their main henchman right uh when uh think progress the uh, uh journalistic arm of center for american progress tried to unionize this was the lady that decided to fucking fire them all so she pulled a nathan j robinson i guess we'll see but maybe a little bit <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it, it's fucking insane, right, that this lady is a part of the Biden administration after all of the fucking, you know, bullshit, massive unpopularity amongst the regular people. But it's just as Gavin said, right, if you scratch the establishment's back, they'll run cover for you. They'll take care of you. They'll put you somewhere deep in the White House where things like democracy can't get you out. Yeah, it just proves once it just proves time and time again. Like image of the Democratic Party, but the Clintons control the infrastructure. Like all these Hillbots, Clintonite type of uh, people, they never die. 
Like, she's literally the Wicked Witch of the West, but water does not kill her. What kills her? Like, she always comes back around to ruin our, to ruin our, our dreams, our hopes for a better society. Like, God, it's, so, it's going so annoying. When I saw that, I was like, wow, they really like her. So that just really proves time and time again, like, if the Democratic Party likes you, but at the same time, you're a part of all these big corporate interests and also tied to the government, tied to their political allies, they will fight you tooth and nail if you're going down. And they will prop you up and give you any type of position you want just to hold you. So that was my quick opinion on that. Yeah, 100%. Uh, obviously, Nira Tandon is probably one of the cringiest people in American politics. So it's nice to see that her career has uh, has continued to sustain itself uh, with one of the cringiest administrations that we've had. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, about every administration is cringy as hell. Joe Biden, just, I don't know, it's, it's fucking weird because he looks like a zombie. Maybe I've been watching too many horror films, but when I watch him on stage, he looks like, uh, like he just kind of has like this weird like zombie zombification like his his brain is still you know m like his motor functions are like 50 percent there but his critical thinking is only like eight percent there and so you're just watching this very old man with so much power just he's so confused all the time just on stage trying so hard to keep living i don't know it's fucking weird yeah he looks like that old muppet <laughs> 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 yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's hilarious. But RJ, we are pretty much at the end of our show. At the end of one our more thing hour I did here. Uh, uh, shoot out uh, really quickly though is I wanted to get to that uh, Lucas Kuntz uh, polling uh, story right in the bottom really quickly just for like two minutes because uh, outside of this race there aren't that many uh, candidates to be even like on the radar for people. But and obviously I know a lot of people that listen to our show are a little like post electoral politics. But I saw this uh, you know and obviously we're in Missouri so I pay a little bit closer attention to Missouri politics and I just wanted to shout out Lucas Kuntz a guy that we've uh, reacted to some of his stories on the show i believe he was on breaking points for a conversation a lot of people observe that in a cnn interview he has a bunch of magic the gathering cards in the background he seems like an interesting guy but uh you know he's one of those dudes that's former military uh super progressive uh you know um endorses all these kinds of policies and i think that that's the uh, you know, the, when I say all these kinds of policies, I mean the policies that we routinely advocate on a show like this one. Uh, and, and I think that that's the new path, kind of like RJ was saying for, you know, oh, it's going to be really hard for a high profile person like Nina Turner or Brianna Joy Gray to get in. Uh, I think the next kind of face of the progressive movement might be these guys like um, you know, Lucas Kuntz or, or Lee Carter or, or one of these guys that, you know, they kind of have more of a sticks uh, you know, aesthetic to them, right? Like they're working class kind of like country or style boys, uh, but yet their politics are based, right? And they're, uh, they don't represent this kind of liberal elitism or whatever. And, and I think that they might be able to do some work in a, a purple state. Obviously, I'm cautiously optimistic when it comes to a state like Missouri, especially with how disastrous Joe Biden's performances has been. Uh, but I just think Lucas Kuntz is an interesting candidate to watch and somebody that if that's your jam, uh, you might be interested in following that race. Also, too, check out India Walton from Buffalo, New York. She's very interesting. Yeah. That's kind of the one I'm actually optimistic for, surprisingly, because yeah. how she's really snuck under the radar. But at the same time, the state, I mean, the city of Buffalo, they're not happy that she won the primary. I mean, the guy that she lost, to, the guy that uh, she beat wanted to run for independent. They had a whole entire court battle to get him off the ballot. Yep. And also, too, there were talks that in Buffalo, New York, they wanted to get rid of the mayorship entirely <laughs> after she won the primary. So that was crazy. So it's, it's I insane. It reminds me of when the uh, the DSA took over the Nevada Democratic Party and they were basically like, well, not anymore. Now we're all just going to resign and take all the money and peace out. Like, it's just like if we don't win, then fuck the competition, which, again, goes back to one of the reasons why it's so goddamn hard to stomach ever voting for supporting Democrats because they talk about big tent politics and they talk about unification and unity and all this horse shit until they lose until and then they start playing dirty and they fuck the progressive, the socialist every goddamn time. But that being said, I do think you're right. Zach Lucas Coons is significantly more interesting, more populist than your average Democrat. Um, again, not that I think he's going to come in and save the goddamn country or anything, but if you do live in Missouri, it might be worth voting for the guy. He's in or he's in favor of pretty much all the right stuff. And like you said, Zach, he's a normal working class guy. He's an ex Marine, but he's not like he's risen. It's not like he's risen through the ranks of the Democratic Party or the Democratic establishment. He's basically just a normal dude who's running to be a politician for the first time in his life. So again, not that we're saying he's going to you know, come in and save the goddamn day or anything, but certainly uh, a better candidate than most. And I'm also excited to see how that goes. I 
think it's going to be damn near impossible to win in Missouri this time around as a Democrat, just because of the fact that we are um, in the midterms and it's you know historically very difficult for the party in power to retain their um, majority in the Senate or the House. So I think it's just going to be such an uphill battle for a Democrat in a state like Missouri. But if anyone can do it, it could possibly be Lucas. So we are keeping an eye on that one. He is an interesting voice that I, I really respect. So yeah, good stuff. But yeah, RJ, did you have anything else you want to announce or um, plug to our audience before we end today's shows? Um, not really. I've been, I've been busy. This is actually my day off. Usually, usually I work today. So gosh, I've been working in school. So I've been kind of on a hiatus for like the last early months because I've been so busy with stuff, you know, so I really have no plugs right now. Um, in terms of my future, you know, well, we'll just keep that open. We'll see what happens. Well, all right, man. Well, you always have a home on the Vanguard whenever you want to come on and talk some shit. We love having you. I uh, hope you take care, man, and uh, get some relaxation and a little R&R &R on your day off, man. Take care. Oh, thanks. Well, I have a tennis match, but I'm going to be having some fun. I feel like Serena. So thank you, guys. Love you guys. Uh, I will see you guys later. Yeah, peace, comrade. Love you, too. Anyway, that was a great stream with RJ. Great to chat, as always. And just to answer one question in the comments, Coons is actually running to replace retiring Senator Roy Blunt. So Josh Hawley is, unfortunately, our other senator uh, who is still in the Senate. He won't be up for re-election until 2024, I believe. But Roy Blunt, who's been a longtime Republican senator from the state of Missouri, is retiring, which is opening up the Senate seat for a newcomer. And there's a whole cadre of fucking idiots running in this race um, on the Republican side, at least with people like Mark McCluskey, the infamous um, St. Louis citizen that pulled out his goddamn machine gun when <laughs> confronted by peaceful protesters last a uh, couple summers ago, um, as well as Eric Greitens, the uh, criminal sex offender, ex-governor who had to resign in shame. So, yeah, it's it's not looking good here in Missouri, guys. But, yeah, that, that's what's going on. Uh, but yeah, like I said, thanks so much, RJ, for coming on today. Really appreciate uh, the contribution to our show. Love the commentary and perspective as always. And like Zach said, always have a home here on the Vanguard. Um, but yeah. yeah. Uh, just one quick thing, just for anybody who's curious. I do think I've been reading about this race a little bit. It does look like the AG of Missouri, the Eric Schmidt guy. It, it, I, if I'm giving my analytical, honest opinion, it does look like that guy is going to be like a tough motherfucker to beat. I don't think Eric Greitens is going to even be able to tackle him in the primary, uh, mostly because his name is literally Mud uh, for most people here in this uh, this uh, county slash uh, state. Uh, you know, sim similarly to how Kobach just can't fucking win in Kansas, no matter how bad he wants to. It's just like it's a little tough, but yeah, hundred percent. Thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in today, though. And and uh, really appreciate RJ popping by. Always good to have friends of the show on. Oh, and we also have to do one more shout out to our patrons. Right? Yeah, a huge shout out to the patron community. That link is in the description. It's going to be the top link. If you guys want to join our patron community, that's how you can do it. And we do like to shout out our Vanguardian and Comrade level patrons at the beginning and end of every single live stream and in the end credits of all of our video clips so yeah huge shout out to everyone supporting the show on patreon you can find out more about our benefits that we offer in the link below that's going to be the first link patreon.com slash the vanguard channel as i said but yeah you can hit up that if you want to support the show and join our patron community we do offer access to our discord server early access to book club episodes and these shout outs among other benefits so yeah check that out guys really appreciate the support though it keeps the show happening it makes it possible and we genuinely sincerely thank everyone supporting the show uh, if you're not able to support the show obviously that's totally fine as well please just hit that like button and hit that subscribe button if you have not already because that really does help us beat the algorithm and stay around on youtube so yeah thanks so much for tuning in everyone uh really love talking shit today one more thing just to do like a quick shout out i literally just saw this and uh i just wanted to shout it out right as we were leaving uh we've had zoran kwame mamdani on our podcast uh in the past to interview him when he was running uh for office in albany new york and apparently he's 53 hours into a hunger strike right now 53 hours of headache that never leaves breathlessness from climbing uh, a single flight of stairs and pangs of hunger at the mere thought of food, but he's standing up for the taxi drivers in uh, New York. And so just shout out to you, man, fucking base solidarity right there. Uh, Zoran is the definition of a real socialist, somebody that will put his body on the line for the people. Um, so yeah, fuck yeah, man. Uh, that's, that's a heroic action right there and solidarity to you and all the guys and you know people that are working with you. That's, that's good stuff. 
Yeah, that's crazy. That's that's really that's really based of Zohran and and good on him for bringing some more attention to the taxi strike going on in New York City, which has not been getting enough attention. Uh, so that's that's awesome. I didn't I didn't know about that. Um, but that's great. Zohran is definitely a real one. He is based as fuck. He's also been an outspoken advocate for BDS. So a uh, very courageous active ag- advocate. And, you know, he's really showing the how, you know, a, a real socialist, a real revolutionary type progressive should act in elected office. He's um, in the the state assembly in um, New York State, uh, assembly member for the District 36. And, yeah, he was one of the first interviews we did. So, yeah, just solidarity with Zohran. Um, I hope obviously he's okay, but yeah, that, that's, that's good stuff. So yeah, good, good shout out, but yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Really appreciated chatting and we should be back this weekend.